today we will uh, have our final lecture of the year. This is going to serve two purposes. One, make sure we're comfortable with um, any of the questions that might be asked of us about Canada's involvement in the Cold War. Two, to give a little bit of an overview of a lot of major Cold War events. So this is going to be a, a little bit of a timeline of, of big events of the Cold War as well. Uh, we're just kind of fitting Canada in. We're going to start with this very freaky picture. Um, of, uh, of a guy named Igor, or Igor, possibly? Probably Igor. Um, any, any young Frankenstein? No? No, but if you, uh, you're not familiar with Young Frankenstein uh, from uh, 1970s, Mel Brooks? Um, anyway, guy's name was Igor, but it was pronounced Igor. Anywho, uh, this is Igor Guzhenko. Igor Guzhenko. And I G O R. Igor Guzhenko and the Guzhenko Affair. Uh, kind of a crazy story uh, that is going to be a perfect jumping off point or starting off point for Canada's involvement in the Cold War. Uh, Guzhenko worked for the Soviet Union. And he worked for the Soviet Union in their embassy in Ottawa, Canada during World War II. He was a, uh, uh, a um, cipher clerk. He's the guy that is like sending messages back to the Soviet Union encrypted during the war years. All right. Um, so as this cipher clerk during World War II in Canada, he's got a lot of information about what the Soviet Union was up to um, during the Second World War in Canada. When the war comes to an end in 1945, he's got his call, his orders to head back to the Soviet Union. It's time to go back home. And he doesn't really want to leave because Canada's wonderful, right? And he's kind of soured on the whole Stalinist Soviet regime. So he wants to stay in Canada, but he's not just allowed to stay in Canada. The Soviet Union wants him back. Canada doesn't necessarily have to accept him as, as, a, as, as an immigrant. Um, and so he's got to come up with a way to make sure he can stay in Canada. And to do this, he's going to gather up a bunch of documents that will reveal to the Canadians that the Soviet Union had a spy ring in Canada during the Second World War. Looking into what Canada was doing during the war, Canada's involvement with the Manhattan Project, etc. And he compiles these documents, and then he illegally, because they're classified Soviet documents, takes them to an Ottawa newspaper in Canada. He's, he's a 1945 version of a leaker to the press. Like, he's WikiLeaks before the wiki was invented, Right. Canada is going to offer him asylum. They're going to offer him political asylum. He's going to get to stay in Canada because the Soviet Union obviously wants this guy and his information taken care of. Um, and so he's going to live the rest of his life with a new name, a new identity. He pops up on TV every now and again. Um, uh, in, uh, no, he died in the, in the late 1980s. But he pops up on, on Canadian TV every now and again and does interviews. But... He's got a horribly creepy mask or hood or whatever. Recommendation, if you're looking for great Halloween costumes, do not go as the hooded Igor Guzhenko. People, people might uh, make, uh, have, think you have connections with other organizations or whatnot, uh, so don't do that. But what does the Guzhenko affair tell us? One, that the Soviet Union did, in fact, have spies in Canada, as we know they had spies in the United States. Two, it is an early sign of the distrust between the Western countries and the Soviet Union. And three, it's going to spark a bit of a red scare in Canada. It'll never amount to what, what we would see in the United States, but there is a red scare in Canada. Um, government, Canadian government officials that are uh, accused of being uh, sympathetic towards communism or the Soviets they're going to be questioned. Uh, some will ultimately lose their government jobs. Uh, so there is going to be the development of a red scare in Canada. So we can make this Gruzhenko affair really the starting off point of Canada's involvement in the Cold War. And they are very much on Team USA, Team West. All right? Canada is going to be one of the founding members of the NATO Alliance, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, in 1949. Please remember that NATO is born following the resolution of the first Berlin crisis, that Berlin blockade and then the Berlin airlift. After that, the United States is going to organize the North Atlantic Treaty Organization with our Western European allies and Canada. 
This is a military alliance. It's a defensive military alliance. Please do not confuse the role of the United Nations with the role of the NATO nations. The United Nations is an organization meant to provide collective security, which means the collective nations of the world will work together to try to maintain global security. But by 1949, what is the, uh, the elephant in the room uh, with regard to the United Nations? What is the concern that the United Nations won't effectively be able to maintain collective security? What's, what's the con like, what does the United Nations have to have in order to have a military response to aggression? Everyone has to agree. Yeah. Everyone has to agree. Not, not everyone. everyone. Security Council. Yes. Uh, wow. Uh, not everybody has to agree. Just the Perfect. Security Council has to be a majority of Security Council nations, and it's got to be the five permanent members not vetoing it, right? Those five permanent remember members, you need to know it's the United States and Soviet, Soviet Union and China, China and, but, but remember, we don't, once, once the Chinese Civil War comes to an end with the victory of the communists, we kind of let Taiwan, rather than mainland China, have that seat. France and Britain, right? So you've got to have all five of those nations on board if there's going to be any kind of military response to aggression. And as we are moving quickly into a Cold War story, it's going to be hard to imagine a scenario where the U.S. and the Soviet Union are seeing eye to eye on military action. That precipitates the need for NATO. NATO is a military defensive alliance that guarantees that if any NATO nation, if any NATO nation is attacked, all NATO eight nations are compelled to support that attacked member. All right? So now that Western Europe and Canada and the United States are members of NATO, if France gets attacked, all of these NATO nations must defend. So this is a military defensive alliance. The United Nations offers the hope of maybe military defense, but only if the Security Council goes along with it. Canada, of course, is, an, as a, is a member of that alliance. Yes, sir? So um, this is kind of like a... Because I'm not thinking like the NATO and Warsaw Pact are kind of like this. Because there are too many divisions in the UN. Yeah. There's so many divisions divisions in the UN. Yeah. They had to like fund like subset. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because they can't really trust that the UN is going to do anything in the in the face of aggression. Because the Soviet Union would be able to to veto anything, or on the other side, the Americans would be able to veto anything. Please note the United Nations. Or pardon me, NATO comes first. NATO was born in 1949. The Warsaw Pact is born in 1955. Warsaw Pact is going to be created after NATO admits West Germany into its membership. So once West Germany becomes a member of NATO and can, is a part of that same defensive alliance, that's when the Warsaw Pact will be born. Next step in Canada's involvement in the Cold War is by being a, a defensive, uh, in a defensive alliance with the United States. We want to take a look at this map of the world, not from an angle we normally see. And we're looking here with the North Pole right in the center of the map, and we've got the Soviet Union on one side and then North America on the other. Please note that um, the shortest distances uh, between the Soviet Union and the United States is not by going all the way around the planet or going all the way around the planet, it might very well by going uh, north across the North Pole. You guys might know that if you've ever flown to Europe, you're not flying in a, in a straight line to Europe. You're flying like way north above Greenland and Iceland likely to get to Europe because it's a much shorter flight going in that direction. So if there's going to be an attack coming from the Soviet Union, and once the Soviet Union develops their bomb in 1949, how is that bomb delivered? What's the earliest delivery system for the Soviet Union? By airplanes, right? So these planes are likely going to be flying over Canadian airspace to get their way into the United States. All right? They're not going to fly due east or, or due west. So the, uh, another early step between the United States and Canada in our Cold War defense is by the creation of an air defense system in Canada that, to provide early warning of Soviet attacks. The very first was known as the Pine Tree Line, and this is just over the northern border of the United States. It, it's, it's, a, it's a system of radars 
uh, the connection of radar systems along that, that line that will give an early warning to any incoming Soviet planes. So if they detect planes coming in, they let the Americans know, and we hopefully can get some of our planes in the air to shoot those guys down. Now you can see with this earliest pine tree line, we're not getting a whole lot of warning coming in. So later in the 1950s, a more northern line would be developed called uh, the Mid-Canada Line. This used a newer type of radar, but ultimately um, was, was scrapped pretty, pretty quickly, um, and, and a final line far to the north in Canada, above the Arctic Circle, uh, will be developed. And this is called the DEW line, the DEW line, D-E-W, the Distant Early Warning Line. So pine tree, then what? Pine tree, mid-Canada, then the DEW line. And these are radars in the North Atlantic that would be able to detect any incoming Soviet planes to give ample warning time to the Americans to, to assemble a response. All three of these lines, though, will ultimately prove themselves pretty uh, outdated once the Soviet Union develops the next level of delivery system. And what is that? A rocket, very good, with sound effects, excellent. Long, long-range ballistic missiles, right? Um, and also, once the Soviet Union is going to start to develop sub-range ballistic missiles, and they can put submarines either on our east or west coast, the, these lines don't mean much of anything anyway. So the development of ICBMs are going to render these slightly less useful. As such, we have to come up with a new plan with our Canadian allies. And in 1957... Canada and the United States will develop what is known as NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command. NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command. Yes, oh yeah, very good. Thank you. Good, good job, Farah. You're always on the ball. Well done. Um, North American Air Defense. North American. Um, so this is a joint U.S. and Canadian operation, born in 1957, to provide air defense and early warnings of Soviet attacks. Uh, is one of our bases in the mountain? Yeah, you guys... Uh, yeah. Um, some of, NORAD's, uh, uh, some of NORAD's bases, are, or one of NORAD's bases, is in Colorado on a mountain called Cheyenne Mountain. And it's, uh, if, if you've ever seen the 1980s movie, a classic 80s film called War Games with Matthew Broderick, much of that takes place, um, supposedly, inside this mountain. Uh, yep, yep, NORAD uh, still exists. Um, it, it, we've changed the name, though. It's not air uh, defense. It's now aerospace defense, because NORAD also deals with stuff going on in space. So what are they trying to prevent this a nuclear attack on the United States. So, not trying to prevent nuclear attack, but it's trying to, to be able to see an incoming attack and deal with it when it, when it comes. What's that? Well, you could see when the missiles are on their way, but uh, not much help beyond that. As a part of NORAD, and will develop into an early crisis in the Cold War between the United States and Canada is the, what's known as the Bomark Anti-Ballistic Missile. This is an American-developed anti-ballistic missile that the United States wanted to deploy in Canada in the late 1950s. This will turn into a political crisis between the United States and Canada as the Canadians learn that these Bomark missiles are actually themselves going to be equipped with a nuclear warhead. Basically, the idea is to use a small nuclear device in order to disable a n incoming nuclear missile. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're hoping it's going to happen far over the North uh, North Canadian Arctic, and not many people would be there. But you can imagine the Canadians might say, whoa, 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 we're going to be housing dozens, like we wanted 60 of them up there. We're going to be housing dozens of these things. Things can go wrong. You never know what's going to happen. And, like, if the attack is going to come, the Americans are basically saying, yeah, we'll, we'll take out these nuclear weapons right above your country, right? And you can, you can imagine the problem that some Canadians are going to have with this.
So this is going to turn into a little bit of a political dust-up in Canada. Between those in Canada that, that want to house these missiles and want to be on Team USA in the Cold War, and those in Canada that, that are reluctant to bring these nuclear weapons into their country for fear of any possible negative consequences that could come. Ultimately, in 1963... A, a new Canadian government uh, will allow these weapons to be uh, brought into Canada, but it's going to start a, a political controversy and a popular anti-nuclear weapons movement in Canada. So, like, people will start taking to the streets to protest uh, the, this, uh, the allowance of these nuclear weapons in Canada. By 1969, a new Canadian government will be elected, that will begin to phase out these missiles in Canada and ultimately eliminate America's nuclear defense in the country of Canada. All of it? Yep, there's no more American nukes in Canada. Now let's rewind a little bit and go back to the 1950s, um, talk about some of the big events of the Cold War. In the Korean War, Canada will be involved in the Korean War. It is a United Nations action. Please remember that in Korea, the United States and France and Britain and Taiwan all supported United Nations action in Korea. Soviet Union had abstained from that. The Soviet Union was boycotting pardon me, the Security Council at that time. So the Korean War is a United Nations war. As such, Canada is involved as a member of the United Nations. They will send about 26,000 troops into Korea. For comparison's sake, the United States had more than 300,000 troops, but Canadian population is about a tenth of the population of the United States. Canada will also send eight naval destroyers to, to the Korean Peninsula, and they will often uh, or also use their Royal Canadian Air Force, their RCAF, um, to supply uh, troops and uh, supplies. Uh, transport troops and supplies during the course of the war. Please remember, if you get a question on your IB exam for paper two, about air power during war. Kids often just think about being able to bomb stuff. But air forces also transport goods and people back and forth. They sent eight of what? Eight naval destroyers. So Canada gets involved in the uh, Korean War after the war. Canadian troops are members of a United Nations peacekeeping force that will uh, guard that border, or a military uh, force that guards the border, uh, that demilitarized zone. They'll keep an eye on um, uh, to make sure that that, that what parallel? 38th 38. parallel is not violated. Yes, ma'am. Through airplanes. It's Royal Canadian Air Force. All right, I'm going to spend a few more minutes talking about this Cold War crisis and Canada's involvement in it. We've mentioned already the, the Suez crisis. Um, this could pop up on a, on a paper two question on topic, uh, on the Cold War topic, where you have to write about maybe one or two Cold War crises. You might do the Berlin crisis of 48, 49. You might do the Berlin crisis of 1961. You might do the Cuban Missile Crisis. You might do the Suez crisis. Uh, to remind you, the Suez Crisis has its origins with a new president of Egypt, a guy named Gamel Abdel Nasser, N-A-S-S-E-R. And Nasser wants more money to be able to build this big dam he wants to build on the uh, Nile River. Today it's been built. It's called the Aswan High Dam. Uh, he, he needs money for it. And his greatest resource, he thinks, that he doesn't have control of is the Suez Canal. It's the most important waterway on the planet, and it's owned by a joint British and French company that's taking the profits from that canal and sending them back to Europe. Nasser, in the summer of 1956, will nationalize that canal. He takes it over for himself. He sends his military in to take over the operation of the canal. This has Britain and France deeply agitated with Gamal Abdel Nasser, and they want him out. At the same time, Egypt's neighbor in Israel also hates Gamal Abdel Nasser. Since the end of the, uh, the 1948 war that created Israel, 
the Egyptian president, or when Nasser came to power, he began arming Palestinian fighters to hop across the border back into Israel and target Israeli citizens. And this had been happening for, for a couple years now. And so now you collectively have Britain and France and now Israel all pretty cranky with Egypt. And so they come up with a plan in October of 1956 to oust Nasser from power. The plan is going to have Israel invade into uh, Egypt, into this big region of Egypt called the Sinai Peninsula, and march their way all the way down to the Suez Canal, where Britain and France will then call on Israel and Egypt to both withdraw their armies. And when those countries won't, because why does Egypt have to withdraw its armies from the Suez Canal if it's like in its own country? When those countries won't, Britain and France will then send paratroopers in to oust Nasser. That's the plan. This goes off in 1956, in October of 1956, which just so happens to be the month before what happens in the United States. Election. Very good. It's a presidential election in October of 56. Eisenhower is furious when this, this uh, Suez crisis develops, right? He says for Israel and, and Britain and France to immediately with, uh, remove themselves from, uh, from Egypt, right? He doesn't want a big crisis to brew in the Middle East. It's actually one of the rare points in the Cold War story that the United States and the Soviet Union, Eisenhower and Khrushchev, are like on the same page. They both didn't want to see what Britain and France and Israel were doing uh, with, with Egypt. In the aftermath of this Suez crisis, of course, Egypt, uh, or pardon me, Israel will back out. Britain and France will back out of Egypt. But in the aftermath, it is a Canadian diplomat named Lester Pearson. In the 1960s, he's going to be their prime minister. But in 1956, he was a Canadian diplomat who will orchestrate the development of what is called the United Nations Emergency Force, the UNEF. And it is going to be the first large-scale armed United Nations peacekeeping force. Basically, UN soldiers from UN nations that will go to Egypt and they will dot the border between Egypt and Israel to guarantee that that border is not violated. It is going to be led by a Canadian general and it will have a, a, a large percentage of its force and supplies provided by Canada. For his efforts, Lester Pearson is going to win a Nobel Peace Prize. Because the world looks at it and says, yay, it looks like this is a good idea, and this is what the United Nations is supposed to do, to try to keep peace between nations that might not like each other very much. As a side note to this story, the United Nations Emergency Force is only in existence in the Egyptian side of the border. They're only on the Egyptian side of the border. And they only get to be there at Egypt's, Egypt's uh, wishes, right? As soon as Egypt says, go home, they've got to go home. They're not allowed to be there unless Egypt welcomes them. And by 1967, by the spring of 1967, the leader of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, is going to send them away, going to tell the United Nations Emergency Forces to leave. That is going to precipitate Israel launching in the attack that we now know as the Six-Day War in June of 1956. So if Israel invaded like, Egypt when UNEF was there, UNEF was supposed to like, stop him, absolutely. Israel? Sure, to stop that from happening. And that never happened, so they, they never did. But as soon as the United Nations Emergency Force leaves because Nasser asked them to leave, then Israel will attack across that border, because they, Israel claims they feel threatened. If you want to know more about this stuff, we don't get in deep of the Arab-Israeli conflict, but you can always head to Dobiecast and watch all those old lectures. Yes? Um, did Israel then, since they launched the attack in the Sixth Day War, yeah. did that cause bad relations with the United Nations? Um, it did not cause, um, well, there, there absolutely would be resolutions to, to stop, like UN attempts at resolutions from the Security Council to stop that war, but the United States vetoed them. Um, before Israel would attack in the, the Six Day War, um, an Israeli foreign minister went to the United States and said, hey, we're getting threatened by Egypt. 
like they, they close the Straits of Turan, this waterway that kind of lets them, lets Israeli shipping into southern Israel. They close that down. They call for the removal of the United Nations emergency forces. Egypt is moving their armies to the border. It's kind of looking threatening. And so they said to President Johnson, we need your help. And Johnson said to Israel, you don't need our help. If they attack you, you're not going to lose. We don't, we don't believe you. And what Johnson issued was what was called, uh, what's known as the yellow light. Uh, proceed with caution, Israel. If We said to Israel, if you get attacked by Egypt, we will be on your side. But if you attack Egypt, you're on your own. We're, we're, we're not helping you. But what Israel heard is, we're not stopping you. So you do what you need to do, Israel. Um, and so Israel goes back and says, the Americans won't stop us, like they did in the Suez crisis. The Americans won't stop us, we can do what we want to do. And in the next week, they did just that. All right, press on. Cuban Missile Crisis. Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962. We remember the story. In October of 1962, an American U-2 spy plane took some pictures above Cuba. And when our CIA investigated those pictures, we found that the Soviets had been putting long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles in Cuba. This is not just a threat to the United States. It's also a threat to Canada. Because those missiles, in addition to reaching American cities, they could also reach all the big cities of eastern Canada, including Toronto and their capital at Ottawa. So this is not just an issue for the United States, it's also for Canada. The Canadian Prime Minister at the time, a guy named John Diefenbaker. <laughs> I never heard of the guy before I uh, started talking about this stuff uh, with you guys. So John Diefenbaker and John Kennedy are the American and Canadian counterparts uh, during this, this crisis. They have a little bit of a checkered relationship. When Kennedy was first elected president and made his first state visit to Canada, an American diplomat named Walter Rostow left behind a little note, left behind a little memo, he, he didn't mean to, that the Canadians found. And within this memo, known as the Rostow Memo, it basically said that the United States needed to have an upper hand with Canada. We needed to push Canada in our direction. And when this was released, and when the Canadians found this note, the Canadians were furious because it made it look like the, the Americans were dominating this relationship with Canada. So right off the bat, these two guys did not have a good relationship with each other. When the Cuban Missile Crisis erupts and John F. Kennedy informs Diefenbaker about the threat from Cuba, he doesn't quite believe Kennedy. He suggests that the United Nations, because Canada's pretty fond of using the UN, they did it in the Suez Crisis, he believes that the United Nations should be sending in a, a weapons inspections team down into Cuba to see what Cuba was really up to. Kennedy couldn't stand for that because that would be a lot of time, right? And we felt we, this was like a ticking time bomb. We can't wait for a UN uh, weapons inspection team. And plus, who also would have a, a decision on whether weapons inspectors are sent into, United, in, into, uh, into Cuba, Soviet Union? So that may not have even happened anyway because the Soviets might have boycotted it. Or vetoed it, I should say. So initially, Canada is not very supportive of military action. The United States, we told Canada, hey, you guys need to mobilize your army for war, just like the United States was doing. We were sending American soldiers down to Florida to get ready for a Cuban invasion if our negotiations that ultimately happened weren't successful. Canada also dragged their feet in doing this. And in fact, they wouldn't really start to mobilize for any conflict with Cuba until after the whole issue was resolved and, and the agreements had already been made. So Canada is not really um, too supportive of the United States here, which is going to kind of pick up a trend, starting with um, these bomb arc missiles that Canada doesn't want to let into their country, and now the Cuban Missile Crisis, where Canada is still a Western ally of the United States, but they're not in lockstep with the United States. What I think is important to note here is the different relationship between the United States and our NATO allies and the Soviet Union and their Warsaw Pact allies. Note that we are not able to force our NATO allies to do any and everything we want them to do, whereas the Soviet Union has a much stronger hand with their Warsaw Pact allies. All right?
finally, the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War is not, the Vietnam War is not a United Nations war. So Vietnam and Korea, two different wars that often get confused. People think they're very similar. North invades South, blah, blah, blah. Korea and Vietnam War are two very different wars. Vietnam is not a United Nations action. So Canada is not compelled to send any troops to Vietnam. And also, we already talked about a little bit of a rocky relationship between Canada and the United States. So Canada does not send a military contingent to Vietnam like they do to Korea. But they're not completely out of the game. Canadian industry, some of it defense industries, like producing weapons of war, they're still humming. And they are going to be selling Americans weapons of war during the Vietnam War. So Canadian industries, and some of them right across the Detroit River in Windsor, that had been supportive of the war efforts during World War II, are doing the same thing during the Vietnam War. There will be about 30,000 Canadians that actually volunteer in the American military to go into Vietnam to fight that war. This is kind of a weird aspect to the American military that still exists to this day. You do not need to be a citizen of the United States in order to join the American military. In fact, we have a lot of immigrants in the United States that are not American citizens, but that join the United States military. Some are doing it as a path towards citizenship, um, and, but that still exists to this day. Yes? There's all kinds of reasons why people, like, maybe they truly believe in the cause. Maybe it's, it's a, an opportunity for adventure. Um, there, what's that? It's, it's a job. Uh, don't, don't scoff at the whole adventure thing. Guys have been, like, taking up arms and going off to war because they think it sounds fun for, like, for the, like remember the Crusades? We talked about them in AP World. Well, hey, you're kind of bored. you got nothing to do. Wait, you're going to give me guns and I go get to fight in a war? It sounded appealing to a lot of people. This is, this is earlier in the, the war effort. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I'm, I don't, I'm not saying I think it's a good idea, but people did it. Uh, during the Spanish-American War, or not Spanish-American War, the Spanish Civil War, um, there were a number of Americans that, despite the fact that the United States was absolutely neutral in that conflict, a number of Americans joined what became known as the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and, and took up arms and went to Spain to fight alongside uh, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the Republicans in uh, the Spanish Civil War. So this happened, or this is not completely uncommon. Canada becomes even more important as a destination for American draft dodgers and deserters. Those that are attempting to avoid military service if they've gotten drafted, and those that are escaping military service because they've gone what we would call AWOL, absent without leave. They've left their, their post, and they fled to Canada. Now, early in the war, these, they couldn't do this because Canadians would be asking questions at the border about your military status. And if you were in desertion of the American military or if you were dodging your, your draft obligations, the Canadians refused admitting you. But by 1969, this would be, this would be changed. Canadians would stop asking questions about America's mili Americans' military service. So by the time the war comes to an end, about 30 to 40,000 Americans would go to the uh, nation of Canada to live during the war to avoid Amer uh, American military service. How many? About 30 to 40,000. Tens of thousands more Americans would go to Canada as just a means to get away from the political situation of the Vietnam War. You guys remember during the election where you might have heard some Americans saying, if Donald Trump gets elected, I'm leaving, I'm going to go live in Canada. And then the same thing happened like eight years before where other Americans from a different political persuasion would say, if Barack Obama gets elected president, I'm leaving for Canada. And all of those people still live like next door to us. None of them leave, they just talk a big game. <laughs> but during the Vietnam War, during the Vietnam War, some Americans were actually packing their bags and leaving because they did not support American policy in Vietnam. They didn't want to be a part of this nation. When this happens, whether it be deserters or draft dodgers or those that were politically opposed to America's involvement in Vietnam didn't maybe have an opportunity to get drafted but just wanted to leave, these people tended to be younger. They tended to be educated. 
and they tended to be very politically liberal, politically to the left, right? What do we call it when tens of thousands of people, young people, educated people, leave a nation for another nation? Brain drain. This is a small example of a brain drain. Now, it's not going to be detrimental to the United States. It's really a drop in the bucket of our national population. But it is going to send a pretty sizable chunk of politically active, left-wing, educated young people into Canada. And it's going to kind of pull Canadian politics as a whole more to the left. In Canada, they tend to be more liberal, uh, more supportive of government programs. You pay higher taxes, but there's more government programs and social safety nets set up in Canada than in the United States. So these, these immigrants to Canada during the war are going to have a political impact on, this, on the nation of Canada. In 1977, President Jimmy Carter will offer that pardon to all of those American draft dodgers and deserters that have left. Uh, during the war years, about half of them will return to uh, Canada or to the United States. Wait, what was this? 1977. He he just offer, offers a blanket amnesty. If you left the United States because you were drafted and you broke the law because you did not follow your draft obligations, he offered a blanket amnesty, a blanket pardon of all of them. Uh, Half of them would stay because they, they liked what Canada was all about. Uh, yes? <laughs> yeah. No, you would have to have a different pardon. Yeah, you'd have to have... I don't really see another draft ever happening. That, that would be my guess. Is, cause, like, we haven't had a draft for the military since the Vietnam era, so now that's, that's 40 years, 45 years since we've had a draft. Um, I, I, can you imagine how politically unpopular a draft would be today? Um, and so I, and, and I also think, I also think today compared, like, look at how many Americans work from their home today um, and, and can do their business from their, from their living room, right? Well, there's no reason you can't do that same job from any living room in the United States or any living room anywhere in the world, right, as long as you've got an Internet connection. So I think there would be such a larger percentage of people that would decide to just go elsewhere where they could avoid it. So I, I don't see a, a military draft happening again. Yeah. yeah. Well, then maybe you're stuck. I don't know. I, I just don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. And I also don't think, like, the next war is going to require 10 million people. Like, World War II had 10 million people. Um, during the Vietnam War, remember, at our, at our height, we had almost a million guys in country. We, we didn't get close to that in our most recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so I, I, I don't think we, like, the next war is going to be very technological, uh, um, from a, fought from a distance. Um, I, I don't see the need for that big of an infantry force. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. No, yeah. Then why, then why, were, there, uh, why were people back then by, by, like, completely, almost completely okay with the drafts like during the Korean War, for example? Um, I think it was a little bit of a different era that was during the Red Scare. People didn't question American policy as freely. Remember, if you were questioning America during the Cold War in the early 1950s, you might have the government and the FBI keeping an eye on you. Um, during the 1960s, there was much more freedom for Americans to challenge uh, what the United States was saying and doing on an international scene. I, I just think that time changed. And today, I think it's even more so. I think Americans today feel even more comfortable critiquing their country. Uh, you guys can decide whether or not this is a good thing for a country, uh, but I think, I think Americans today feel much more comfortable uh, challenging the, the things our country is up to. Um, one more note about Canada. Uh, they will be uh, one of the prime destinations for Vietnamese refugees after the end of the Vietnam War. Tens of thousands of Vietnamese, uh, what are known as the boat people, and I think we heard Kayla talk about this a little bit, right? Uh, these are those Vietnamese that will flee South Vietnam after the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, some of them taking horribly dangerous journeys across uh, the, the ocean to get to the Philippines um, and, uh, and looking for refuge anywhere they can find it. Um, Canada will accept about 60,000 of these boat people into their country um, as refugees following the end of the Vietnam War.
And so they will establish a, a small but vibrant Vietnamese community in many, many large Canadian cities like Toronto, Ottawa, Vancouver, Victoria. Um, and they will remain evermore. So, uh, so Canada during the Cold War, I think we got a couple trends, right? Early Cold War, Canada very much on Team USA, following in lockstep with us. Then we get into the nuclear age, and Canada's got some deep reservations about allowing American nuclear arms into their country. Canada will be less supportive of America in the Vietnam War. They don't enter, actually, directly into that conflict. Um, but two notes. One, the United States never is able to, or would never, um, do what the, the Soviet Union has to do to countries like Poland or, or, or Czechoslovakia, countries that aren't following in lockstep with Soviet policies. The United States never makes that kind of step to force Canada along. And the relationship never becomes too fractured between the United States and Canada. They still have, they, they, Canada is still a member of NATO to this day, even though they've decreased their, their commitment to NATO. Canada is still a member of NATO. They're still obviously friendly to the United States nation um, economically. We've got deep economic ties between our countries. Um, so, uh, so that is that. Canada in the Cold War.